Good morning, Martin County. Today is 27 November 2022. Man, how time flies when you're having fun. Feels like Turkey Day was just a couple of short days ago. Go figure. Today we want to broaden the scope of our normal discussion out to a more macro level and look at how things actually get to where they are. We want to demonstrate how we, as individuals are the biggest part of the environment we live in and by not accepting the things that you think are too big to change how you can actually make a very big difference so strap yourself in hang on and get ready to explore as we take another trip down the rabbit hole one of the most elemental bedrocks of self is honesty. Not just the honesty we espouse, but the honesty we have with ourselves. Our self-honesty is so vitally important to our decision-making process and to our character that we need to be ultra aware of it. Even if we do not share these honesties of what we really believe, we still need to know in our heart of hearts what and why we believe what we believe. Some of our belief is straight up faith, but other honest beliefs which ultimately form our foundational principles are typically self-discovered if we are observant enough to question the world and the logic used to getting us there. If we know right from wrong and can identify the difference between the two, then we'll have an easier time in deriving our self-honesty. It'll help us to not be homogeneous but distinguishable amongst our counterparts. When those distinguishable differences show themselves, it makes it easier to find a deeper knowledge of the self-honest belief when we engage those of different ideas. It allows for growth, not conflict. In our natural effort to figure out the world around us, we need to be self-honest first. If we're not self-honest, then we cannot be honest with another. Without that honesty, there's no truth amongst us, and relationships either fail quickly or never establish at all. At the macro and micro level, relationships exist whether you want them or not. We have a question for you. Do you live in the aesthetics and not in the passion for honesty and truth? Are you going through the steps of being whatever the current trending zeitgeist of the day is? Where... Uh, here we go. Zeitgeist is defined as the general intellectual, moral, and cultural climate of the era. Are you personally subject to trends, fads, cultural mainstream, and those conversations that seem to be lacking enough substance to maintain the rigors of time? As a community, big or small, national or local, we have a zeitgeist. In Martin County, I'm sure you can think of the main theme of the governmental zeitgeist with the commission, or even the zeitgeist of the school board, Stewart Commission, Indian Town Council, and others, or even when we look at the zeitgeist of the philanthropic, economic, environmental discussions, and so on. Now ask yourself, is the current atmosphere and accepted mainstream of conversation, the zeitgeist of Martin County, based in honesty? Pick a topic and challenge yourself to answer that question for yourself. So how does this zeitgeist or expected narrative come to a culmination of acceptable truth in the first place? And how can a false narrative sometimes become so commonplace that it's accepted as truth? Enter our culprit and our weapon, if we know how to wield it, the Overton window. Here's a brief explanation of the Overton window. Take the Overton window was developed in the mid-1990s by the late Joseph P. Overton, who was senior vice president of public policy at the time of his death in 2003. The Overton window is a model for understanding how ideas in society change over time and influence politics. The core concept is that politicians are limited in what policy ideas they can support. They generally only pursue policies that are widely accepted throughout society as legitimate policy options. 
These policies lie inside the Overton window. Other policy ideas exist, but politicians risk losing popular support if they champion these ideas. These policies then lie outside of the Overton window. But the Overton window can both shift and expand. Either increasing or shrinking the number of ideas politicians can support without unduly risking their electoral support. See, sometimes politicians can move the Overton window themselves by courageously endorsing a policy lying outside the window, but this is rare. More often, the window moves based on much more complex and dynamic phenomena, one that's not easily controlled from on high. It's the slow evolution of society's values and norms. Think for a minute about education policy. By and large, our society agrees that providing children with a formal education is a good thing. But how best to accomplish this policy is a wide open question. There are dozens of different policies that could be used to come to a conclusion. Now, Imagine the different policy options for providing children a formal education lined up along a linear spectrum. On one end, you find a policy idea to use the power of the federal government to provide education to all children, a top-down, centralized approach. On the other end of the spectrum, spectrum, you'd find just the opposite policy idea. No government involvement whatsoever, leaving the provision of education to private citizens. See, that shows how a handful of these policy options and ideas have broad ends to them, but we all know that there is more that exists in the middle. So virtually no politician endorses either one of the policies at either ends of the spectrum. We can posit then that these policies lie outside the Overton window. These policies that politicians do champion tax-funded public school districts, regulated private schools, independent public charter schools, etc., exist between these two ends of the spectrum and are solidly within the Overton window. To get an idea of how the Overton window can change over time, think about the Prohibition era. Just a few generations ago, the sale and use of alcoholic beverages was made illegal by federal law, suggesting that this policy was safe inside the Overton window. But fast forward to today when people poke fun of the folly of prohibition and virtually no politician endorses making alcohol illegal again. The Overton window has clearly shifted and prohibition is no longer within its borders. The Overton window doesn't describe everything about how politics works, but it does describe one key thing. Politicians will not support whatever policy they choose whenever they choose Rather, they will only espouse policies that they believe do not hurt their electoral chances. And the range of policy options available to a politician are shaped by ideas, social movements, and shared norms and values within a society. All of this suggests that politicians are more followers than they are leaders. It's the rest of us who ultimately determine the types of policies that they will get behind. It also implies that our social institutions, families, workplaces, friends, media, churches, voluntary associations, think tanks, schools, charities, and many other phenomena that establish and reinforce societal norms are more important to shaping our politics than we typically credit them for. So if you're interested in policy change, keep the Overton window in mind, as it's a helpful guide. If your idea lies outside the window, trying to convince politicians to embrace it is a steep hill to climb. You'll likely need to start at ground level, the grassroots, slowly building support for your idea throughout the broader society. And then if it catches root there, politicians will eventually come on board. Even if the policy change you care about most currently lies within the window, maybe you should reevaluate if there's a better option that you're not considering because it lies outside of the Overton window and no current policy or politician will endorse it. Can the Overton window be shifted by lies, distortions, 
or misunderstandings? You betcha. But it's obviously wrong to intentionally disseminate misleading information. The Overton window reflects what society believes, which can be as easily influenced by truth and facts as it can be by inaccurate or deceptive information. Even mistakes can shift the window. You see, the massive underestimation of Medicare costs probably contributed to the program's creation in the 1960s. The false belief that weapons of mass destruction could be found in Iraq contributed to the support of the war. Or, like the idea that banning pet stores from selling dogs, cats, and rabbits will eliminate the so-called puppy mills. This is why honesty especially self-honesty, is so important in our decision-making process of beliefs and principles. Without self-honesty, we do not find truth. W rather, we find perceptions. We live in the aesthetics and allow others with more powerful self-interest and ideas to move the Overton window and dictate the zeitgeist of the day. So if politicians are making their decisions like rural land changes, banning pet stores, strip clubs, or restricting the size of the commercial fish fishing industry in the county, by looking into the zeitgeist of today and making their decisions, what does that then mean for us? It means that for whatever reason, the politicos have been convinced that the voting public zeitgeist of the day supports these ideas. Even when they're not honest truth or the majority of the citizens' beliefs and desires, Instead, the window is shifted to represent a fabricated zeitgeist of peer pressure and belief that everyone is thinking this way and you must be the only one who feels differently, even when the opposite is true. Lack of honesty does not lead to truth. And without truth, well, trust is no place to be found. Ever wonder why you don't trust politicians, even when it appears so many do? Your words, ideas, actions, outcomes, and behaviors lend to the formation of the zeitgeist of the day. When we're founded in self-honesty and base our thoughts and words on discoverable truth, then we lend a realistic quotient to the establishment of the zeitgeist in our world. When we go along to get along or follow the crowd, well then, we're much like sediment in the current of a river waiting to be deposited wherever the river settles, whether it's where we want to be or not. As we all discover and live within truth as families, peer groups, church organizations, community, nation, or even humankind. We influence the thinking of the day, and it becomes harder for politicos to act outside of the interest in faults and evil ways. But if we allow the pressure of outside influence, much like peer pressure in junior high school, to manage our thinking, if we allow the little screens we gaze into with endless interaction and do not question the aesthetics, then we become susceptible to allowing others to move Overton's window in a direction that inherently goes against what we know to be honest and right. When we're self-honest in our objective view of the world around us, close or far away, we must remain self-honest in that effort as to be honorable to the greater good of mankind and to our communities, families, and to ourselves. For without self-honesty, there can be no honesty to share with others. And without honesty to share, there can be no trust amongst us. And without trust, there are no healthy relationships, be they personal, local, national, or global. That doesn't bode well for anyone. So be honest with yourself first. Question your beliefs. Find truth and share it in the being of who you are. Live your honesty. Get out of the aesthetics and into the passion of life. We all have lines. Lines that once crossed are signals to us. And those lines in the sand are best established when we are self-honest. From there, the rest comes naturally for all of us. Enough said. No more out.